Rejected titles, mirror troubles, and martial arts legends of the past and future. Turns out you don't need a huge budget to make a masterpiece like Enter the Dragon. Bruce Lee didn't necessarily come to America to be a movie star. In fact, according to Lee himself, he came to America to escape his growing life as a street criminal. In America, he began teaching Wing Chun Kung Fu and gained reputation as one of the best martial arts instructors in the country, giving him a star-studded cast of students. Lee's student list would be the envy of any starstruck sensei. According to AsianJournalUSA.com, he taught Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lee Marvin, Roman Polanski, and Sharon Tate. He also trained martial arts legends Chuck Norris and Taki Kamara. But according to several sources, James Coburn was Lee's favorite Hollywood student. Coburn was a pallbearer at Lee's funeral, as was Coburn's fellow The Magnificent Seven alum Steve McQueen. Given McQueen's lifelong reputation as one of Hollywood's true tough guys, his friendship with Lee spoke to his deep respect for the man. Now, as a fighter, Steve, Steve McQueen, that son of a gun, got the toughness in him. While Lee reportedly fell out with some of his A-list clients at the time because of his own Hollywood ambitions, no doubt he learned some kernels of showbiz wisdom while teaching them how to throw kicks and punches like a true master. If you're a fan of kung fu films, you probably watched the Ip Man series. Ip Man was a real Wing Chun master, and his skill was so legendary that he had a film series based on him, an honor attained by almost no other living sensei. It makes sense, then, that Ip Man was Lee's kung fu master. That also explains Lee's devotion to authenticity. Not only was he a legitimate martial artist, but the best way to honor his master and the man's teachings would be to authentically share them with a the world audience. Ip Man was such a legendary and skilled martial artist that not only did he inspire the four Ip Man films in the main series and several other standalone Ip Man films, but he's also the focus of a film called The Grand Master. The actor who played Ip Man in the popular series, Donnie Yen, would achieve American mainstream success for his role as a Force monk in Rogue One Star Wars Story. There's no doubt having trained under a real master whose life also makes such compelling cinema would go on to influence Bruce Lee's films, including Enter the Dragon. Although Warner Brothers Pictures got behind Enter the Dragon and bet on Bruce Lee becoming a star, he still had trouble convincing the executives there of his vision. Lee's daughter, Shannon, wrote in her book, Be Water, My Friend, The Teachings of Bruce Lee, that her father battled the studio over the Enter the Dragon screenplay. As Shannon put it, the original script had none of the iconic scenes that exist today. Oh, don't hit back. Warner Brothers reportedly brought in a screenwriter who didn't know much about Kung Fu. Lee protested, and according to Shannon, the star himself rewrote most of the screenplay. Although Warner Brothers promised to get rid of the writer, the studio secretly sent him to Hong Kong instead to continue working on the script while not incorporating any of Lee's changes. As a result, Lee did not show up to begin filming for two weeks, a standoff with the studio that he eventually won. His changes were utilized in the screenplay, and Lee made Enter the Dragon well and truly his own. Bruce Lee's issues with the film and script also included his dislike for the alternate titles that the studio wanted to use, including Blood and Steel and Hans Island. The big problem seemed to be that the studio wanted a blood-filled fighting movie, while Lee wanted something more transcendent, steeped in the philosophical pursuits that had defined Lee's martial arts pursuits. Blood and Steel hinted at a lurid action movie, which could be considered a draw for an audience whose knowledge of kung fu was limited at the time. It might have also been a reference to the steel blade hand that the villainous Han busts out in his fight against Lee. Han's Island was a pretty on-the-nose title that simply explained the setting of the movie, a tournament on opium kingpin Han's private atoll. Enter the Dragon gave the movie the depth that Lee brought to his martial arts, and the dragon in the title hinted at the heritage that was so important to Lee. For Lee, bringing legitimacy to his first big Hollywood film was everything. He wanted it to be as genuine as possible, from the locations to the philosophies he studied. Even more important to him was the authenticity of the martial arts practiced in the movie. A good fight should be like a small play, but played seriously. John Saxon, who played Roper, trained in judo and karate for years before Enter the Dragon. Jim Kelly, who handled the role of Williams, was a black belt and international karate champion. Kian Shi, who played Han, had been training in martial arts for most of his life and starred in several hundred martial arts films. Bob Wall, Angela Mao, Bolo Young, and Sammo Hung were a few of the other big names in martial arts to round out the cast. According to Variety, racial issues also affected Lee's big studio film with Warner Brothers. Lee had long dealt with racism and intolerance in America, but Shannon Lee explained in her book how Warner Brothers was influenced by the racial sentiments of the time, writing, Hollywood billed it as a double lead in case their gamble on my father didn't pay off, and in part due to the intense prejudice and concern surrounding the xenophobia of audiences of that time. 
In the film's opening credits, it's John Saxon who shares co-lead credit with Lee, but both he and Jim Kelly share coverage on the movie poster. Kelly was an American and a great martial artist, but he was black, while Saxon was American and white. Either way, according to Shannon Lee, the studio didn't think an Asian man would be able to carry the film, regardless of the fact that he was arguably the best martial artist of his generation. Thankfully, Lee's role as a champion of Eastern culture continues today and the endless influence his philosophy and his films continue to have. One of the most eye-catching scenes in Enter the Dragon is the one where Han lures Lee into a hall of mirrors. The disorienting nature of that scene isn't just a camera trick, it was actually a tough scene to execute. They had to build a closet full of mirrors, then shoot inside it despite any and all challenges of reflection, lighting, and movement. Cinematographer Phil Hubbs went through the process in a Q&A about the film. According to Hubbs, the sequence was director Robert Klaus's idea. When they shot it, they would cut a hole in a different spot in the mirrored wall to move with Bruce to a different location. As Hubbs explained, that complicated the image a lot because we were shooting into a mirror and the mirror bounced all around. You actually got nauseous in the room. Bruce banged himself into the mirrors a whole bunch. For a movie that was so financially successful and had such a lasting legacy, you might be struck by how few household names star in it. In fact, the only actor from the movie who would go on to achieve stardom was an unnamed extra, a young martial artist named Jackie Chan. Chan would continue making movies, gaining attention for Drunken Master in 1978 and then the Police Story series. It should be noted that both were produced by Golden Harvest, a company owned by Raymond Chow that got a huge boost from Bruce Lee films. Most Western audiences first discovered him in Rush Hour, and he's been in seemingly countless Hollywood action films since. Since Enter the Dragon was a martial arts film shot in Hong Kong with a mostly Chinese cast, there was bound to be some peacocking. The extras had some training, and supposedly one of them actually challenged Lee to a real fight. Many people wanted to test Lee's fighting skills, as is standard within the martial arts community. According to a vintage interview with cast member Bolo Young, Lee was too fast for his challenger and won, although the extra did land a few blows. In the end, whether participating in a choreographed or actual fight, it seems Lee couldn't be defeated by fist, foot, or weapon. The budget for Enter the Dragon was $850,000, which might seem low, but at the time there had been no big Hollywood martial arts movies. Producer Fred Weintraub explained in a Q&A for the film's 40th anniversary release that it was tough to get the funding, saying, I had to go to foreign investment. The foreign guy told me, well, I can get you two or three hundred thousand out of the Far East. And I said, that's all? You have offended my family, and you have offended the Shaolin Temple. Apparently, the Chinese market was not interested in an American film starring an actor from Hong Kong. After that, Weintraub approached Warner Brothers co-owner Ted Ashley to ask for another $300,000, which Ashley agreed to provide with the condition that he did not spend a dime more. The hustle paid off in spades, however. Enter the Dragon landed at number 13 on the list of top-grossing films of 1973 and was Warner Brothers' third-highest-grossing film of the year. Enter the Dragon not only showed that martial arts movies could play in America, it showed that they could dominate, with the movie ultimately earning more than $21 million in the U.S. alone. According to an interview with Fred Weintraub by Black Belt Magazine, the nightclub owner-turned-producer at Warner Brothers had learned about Lee through his Golden Harvest films and wanted to make a Hollywood picture with him. When Warner Brothers finally produced Enter the Dragon, it was Lee's first great exposure on American soil, aside from his role as Cato in the short-lived 1966 TV series The Green Hornet. After the success of Lee's Hong Kong movies, he was finally able to make a Hollywood movie and make it on his terms. Unfortunately, during what should have been Lee's great moment of glory, the premiere of his first Hollywood film, Lee wasn't present. The movie premiered on August 19, 1973, but Lee had already passed away on July 20th of the same year. The cause of death was a cerebral edema, or swelling of the brain. He died while filming his next movie, Game of Death, which might have cemented him as Hollywood's next great leading man. You would be hard-pressed to find a Hollywood film featuring martial arts before Enter the Dragon, much less focusing on it. A great example of how things changed is found in the zeitgeist following James Bond movies. In Goldfinger, the only martial artist is a powerfully built man of unnamed Asian descent whose skills consist of being very strong and throwing a steel-lined hat. In 1967's You Only Live Twice, Bond goes to a ninja school whose students are used as a mercenary army. By The Man with a Golden Gun, which came out in 1974, Bond puts on a gi and does karate himself. When people talk about classic kung fu movies, they're often referring to the movies produced by the Shaw Brothers in Hong Kong, which at the time were mostly only hits in China. After Enter the Dragon, American action movies began to feature choreographed martial arts fights. Martial arts swept the UK and North America in the early 1970s and never left.